How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. Hi, you're listening to DNA Today, a podcast and radio show where we discover new advances in the world of genetics. From genetic technology like CRISPR to rare diseases to new research, we have you covered. For a decade, DNA Today has brought you the voices of leaders in genetics. I'm Kira Deneen. I'm a certified genetic counselor and your host. Y'all made it happen. DNA Today won the best 2022 Science and Medicine Podcast Award. We are honored to defend our title for the third year in a row. Thank you, listeners. An astonishing, get this, 5.7 million people voted in the podcast awards this year. So it truly took each and every one of you for DNA Today to win. And I have to say, it was perfect timing to close out September, which marked a decade of DNA Today and our 200th episode. Huge shout out to sponsors who make the show possible. I was able to mention a few of them during the acceptance speech, but I was limited to 90 seconds, so I could not highlight all 40 plus. So listeners, make sure you check out our sponsors page at dnatoday.com so you can get all the details and deals there. But anyway, I wanted to thank my team so much for all of their hard work over the years. Thank you, Corinne, Amanda, Kajal, Sonia, Ash, and Megha for all of your incredible dedication to the podcast. You guys, listeners, hear my voice, but these are all the other people behind the show that if it wasn't for them, this podcast would not be able to happen, especially on a weekly basis. Um, It's kind of crazy how much work goes into each episode. Um, I've counted before. I would say it's probably about 15 hours of work that goes into each half hour episode that we have. But it all comes back to you listeners for supporting us for 10 years now And for this award, it's a People's Choice Podcast Award. So thank you so much for choosing us and tuning in, especially for those of you that do it every week. It really means the world to me. Sometimes I feel like this podcast is very one-sided, so it is just really cool to get the recognition from the podcast community and you guys as the listeners for showing up and nominating and voting for us. It really means a lot to us. So thank you so much. And if you're listening to this and you want to congratulate us, head over to social media. We actually just changed our social media handle. So now all over the place, it's at DNA Today Podcast. So we've updated our social media so you can head over there and congratulate us if you want to connect. Um, And also feel free to send us an email, info at dnatoday.com. Thank you guys so much. Hello, my guests today are Amber Olson and Faith McGowan. Amber is the mother of a child with multiple sulfatase deficiency, MSD as we'll probably refer to throughout this interview, which led her to found United MSD Foundation. Faith, our other guest, is a campaign consultant at the foundation backed by 30 years of experience in nonprofit fundraising. Thank you both so much for joining me on this episode. Thank you for having us. Yes, we're excited. Yeah, me too. So Amber, tell me about your youngest, Willow. I want to know all about her. Sure. Okay. So she is now nine years old, just had a birthday. Um, When she, normal pregnancy, um, when she was born, you know, didn't know anything was going on. Um, When she, she was a little bit delayed whenever we went to the pediatrician, she'd always be a little bit behind, you know, but the doctor's like, you know, she'll catch up. She's got older sisters. Every child's not the same. And so, um, but the biggest thing for us is she's never spoken. So she was nonverbal. We um, had her adenoids removed. They thought maybe it was hearing. And then when she was two, I went back to the doctor and I was like, it's gotta be something else. Um, He referred us, the pediatrician referred us to a neurologist. Um, The neurologist, it took about three months to get in. And he um, looked at her and he's like, "She, she looks okay, but like he noticed her thumbs. And then I said, you know, I feel like she's starting to have balance issues. She didn't, she walked like Frankenstein and she walked and ran and crawled and everything, but she, she was starting to have some balance issues and he heard regression and he was like, oh, okay, like let's do a genetic test and um, found because of um, it's deletion on one side, it's auto recessive, the deletion on one side, we found um, 
the multiple sulfatase deficiency, the SUMF1 gene, um, and then did a confirmatory test and then did a biochemical test and everything. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of how we figured it out. Yeah, I'm sure that's like such a short explanation, I feel like, for what sounds like it was years. I mean, you went from, okay, she's having developmental delay compared to right. your other children. So it's like you're kind of your your mom instincts. I'm sure it sounds like they were kind of going off and then just following up with all of that. Um, as you mentioned, a red flag for a lot of different conditions is if there's regression. So I think for, yes. you know, especially students listening, like that's a board exam question kind of thing. So knowing that if there is regression, like someone like a toddler was able to crawl and then wasn't able to crawl. So like achieving a milestone and then not being able to do that anymore. Um, and Amber, you mentioned that MSD is a neurogenerative condition. How does it affect Willow today? You said, you know, she has walked, um, but she is nonverbal. Um, is there any changes that she's had basically since her MSD diagnosis? Yes. So it's, it's very, it's a quick regression. Um, so she turned two, could still walk and run, was starting to have balance issues. But, but by the time she turned three, um, she could no longer walk. She stopped, she stopped crawling. Um, she can still move her hands a little bit, but now at nine years old, she doesn't move at all voluntarily. She has some tremors and stuff like that, but, um, we had to get her a, a feeding tube, um, in the summer after she was diagnosed because, um, she couldn't, she started to have trouble swallowing. Um, and then, um, you know, she's on a BiPAP at night. Um, she has respiratory issues if she gets sick, um, you know, she's, her oxygen drops. I mean, it's, she's, um, total care now. She can't do anything on her own. So how have, how has it been for you and your family to process this? I mean, it's certainly a lot of work and, and the emotional toll and so many different aspects of that, of being her caretaker, um, and just how it affects the rest of the family. Do you feel comfortable sharing some of that? Sure. No. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I'm happy to explain because I think it's, it's hard to understand, you know, it's, um, you know, you're, she was given this diagnosis. I mean, MSD is fatal. Um, and at the time we were told children die before 10 years of age. Now it's, thir you know, the, with the natural history, it's 13, but it's still, you know, we, we knew we were going to lose her. Um, and, you know, that as a parent, that's just unacceptable. You know, it's like, okay, we're, you know, we keep these kids alive. We feed them, clothe them and keep them alive. And, so, you know, it was just the, the worst possible news. And then you add in there, it's going to be regressive. And, you know, they kind of explained it like Alzheimer's, you know, like my grandmother had passed away from Alzheimer's. So I was familiar, you know, that she's just, her body's going to decline. So it's no death is good, but I feel like, you know, watching her um, struggle um, is, is um, very painful for all of us. You know, she has two older sisters, um, they kind of dealt with it. The one, the middle one is closer to her in age and, and, you know, they would play with each other and stuff. She would dress her up and she would go run in her room and take her toys. And um, so, you know, she was young enough that she still connected with her. My oldest knew what was going on and, and just kind of distanced herself, I think. And, and um, still struggles, you know, she's, she went to college like an hour and a half away and she's like, mom, what if, something happens and I'm not able to get home in time. And, you know, so they think, they think about it all the time. And, um, and then my husband is, you know, he's the dad, he's the protector. And, and I, for his little girl, you know, to be struggling is very difficult. Of course. Yeah. Certainly feeling for your family. And I, I think it's important that a lot of these types of conversations and podcasts, we do talk to either the primary caregiver, the advocate in the family, you know, if there's one primarily, that's more prominent, but it's also, I think, really important to keep in mind for healthcare providers that are listening that this does affect everybody in the family. Mm -hmm. You know, you're talking about immediate family. I'm sure extended family members are also, yeah. you know, certainly impacted by this. And I think that's really important that as healthcare providers, you know, certainly we're offering the medical side, but we're also just touching base. Like, how are you doing? How is right. today? Like, how was getting up this morning and getting everybody ready? And just like those simple questions, um, I think are really important. And, you know, just to tie back a little bit to 
the condition itself. So MSD, as we've been explaining, is a neurodegenerative condition. So progressive in that nature, as Amber's describing. On a molecular level, it's a lysosomal condition. So meaning that the our cells have little organs, organelles. And so the lysosome is what's affected in this condition. So what's different about the lysosome? How How is Willow's lysosomes different than say for the people on this panel here that have typical working lysosomes sure so she um she is deficient she has low um sulfatase levels so the sulfatase levels help take this is you know my non-scientific description of it um help take the trash out of the lysosome the lysosome's job is to take the waste out of the cell and so all the you know i don't know if it's all the waste but the waste goes there and then the the sulfatases are supposed to take them out Many of the lysosomal diseases, there are about 50 of them, have a single sulfatase deficiency. Um, hers has actually 17, maybe 18. I think they're still discovering more. Yeah, so most of the um, lysosomal diseases have one deficient sulfatase. Um, she has 17 to 18. And so, and it's actually not that she, they, some of the, the lysosomal diseases have zero uh, sulfatase, hers are low, and then the igniter that ignites them, that's the SUMF1 gene, like its function is to ignite those sulfatases, is deficient. So it's not working properly. So it's a kind of a combination upstream, you know, problem. And when they described it to me, the geneticist had said it's like a ladder and she's missing all of these sulfatases. So what's scientifically pretty fascinating about it is it's like multiple lysosomal diseases. It's like she has like six different lysosomal diseases. She has the characteristics of metachromatic leukodystrophy and San Filippo and Hunter syndrome. So like all of the symptoms are in, you know, this one disease. So I think that helped us, you know, as far as the scientists really are fascinated by it. And they did a ton of work to begin with to discover the gene and figure out the sulfatases and all that kind of stuff. So is that typical for kids that have MSD to have that many sort of conditions in one? Or is Willow more atypical in that sense? No, she's very typical. She's like the most common, late infantile is the most common one. Um, you know, we have some juveniles, um, which they kind of display differently depending on their sulfatase level. So they might actually not have problems or be... Um, they might have regression or not regression, I'm sorry, delays, developmental delays, but it's not as fast as our, as the late infantile as Willow. Uh, <clears throat> and then we have a neonatal where they get sick within that first year um, pretty quickly. And when you, you mentioned meeting with a geneticist, maybe there was a genetic counselor also involved during the diagnostic odyssey. How was it explained to you at the time in terms of obviously processing Willow's diagnosis, but did the geneticist genetic counselor go over future pregnancy risk? Is that a part of the conversation that you had or <clears throat> at that point or a little bit later? Yes. Yeah, so um, the, I think the, yeah, the genet we saw the neurologist, the ne neurologist got the diagnosis. Then we went to a geneticist um, who is actually now on our board of directors. And he, um, he's explained the latter thing and the multiple sulfatases and enzymes. And then he asked, you know, they, I think everybody after that asked, you know, are you planning on having more children? And my, you know, we, this was our third child. You know, I was 37 when I had her, we were not having any more children. So um, we, that kind of stopped the conversation, but I, I've heard the conversation many times about, you know, like you'd be informed going forward so that, you know, and some of our families have multiple children with the disease because they didn't know the diagnosis. We don't have newborn screening. The diagnosis is late. And so, you know, it, it has happened. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's an important part of the conversation, but certainly depends if people are like, you know, as soon as we were pregnant with this baby, we weren't planning on having more kids, like, which sounds like, you know, for you and your partner situation. Right. Um, and you mentioned the way people are diagnosed. So, this is a fairly rare disorder. I mean, how rare is it? Because there's a lot of levels to rare. Right. So it's ultra rare. It's one in 500,000. Um, wow. So, so yeah. how many people, do you have an estimated number of how many people that have been diagnosed? I don't know, like people that are in your community. Yeah. 
So on Facebook, we have a Facebook group, you know, that's how we kind of number things. Um, we have about 70 uh, families in there and that's the husband and wife, the mom and dad, maybe sometimes the aunt. We know of about 22 families in the U.S., um, about a, over 100 worldwide, and that's who people that have reached out to us. Um, so like, I don't know anybody in Australia and I don't know anybody, um, you know, in, in um, some of the uh, large, like Africa, you know, so, um, but I'm sure that there's patients there. They just haven't reached out. So um, the yeah. prevalence, the one in 500,000, I think, you know, there's probably over a thousand. Um, that's what they say. Yeah. And for, you know, you shared Willow's Diagnostic Odyssey. Is that typical for a lot of kids in terms of how they're diagnosed? Because of how rare it is, I imagine you were kind of alluding to before, right. I don't think it's on newborn screening. Um, you know, I can really more speak to the United States, but, um, you know, that's really rare. So I'd be shocked if it was on any newborn screening in the U.S. No, no. We, you have to have a treatment before you can get on newborn screening. So we, that's we are point. pursuing that. Yeah. Um, but it's, yeah, the chicken and the egg. <laughs> It's, yeah. it's, it's a difficult process. Yeah. Um, and so how was Willow actually diagnosed? Was it through the genetic testing? You're talking about like the, the deletion. Was it through mm -hmm. like biochemical studies? Like what was the first diagnosis? So it was a microarray. He did a microarray array looking for, you know, big chunks and the big diseases. And just because there was a deletion, it popped up on the microarray as one side. So it didn't show the other side. So then they had to do a confirmatory test on that gene that SUMF1 was um, bad on the other side. Mm -hmm. And then from there, they did um, a biochemical -chem test to check the enzymes. They checked, you know, I think four of them and they were low. Um, so yeah, that confirmed it biochemically. Um, it used to be that more people would do biochemical first. And so a lot of our kids, they found out they were low in the enzyme first for the sulfatase, and then they would back it up with a genetic test. But yeah, it's, um, the, the diagnostic odyssey is typical of, you know, these rare diseases, you know, so, some of our families, five years, seven years, you know, the juvenile form, we just had a family diagnosed this week, um, <clears throat> the child's 15 years old you know, with the wow. juvenile form. Yeah. Yeah. It certainly can take a long time. The patient advocates we've had on this show, I would say in general, um, they kind of say like five to seven years is, is average for a lot of these types of conditions. Because right. when you go to a healthcare provider, they're not thinking zebra, they're thinking horse. So, right. you know, and that's right. why we've adopted the zebras, you know, yes. one of our icons in the rare disease community. Um, yeah. And I just did want to mention that I learned probably through your website that Invite has a, you know, free to patients. So they're covering the cost and sponsoring it um, for, correct me, lysosomal storage yes, disease Yes, it's the panel. lysosomal storage disease. Um, it's, I think, free in the U.S. and Canada uh, mm -hmm. that, that you can, if you have any kind of, um, you know, and, and things kind of start sometimes it's like ear nose and throat like they have frequent ear infections developmental delay hear a little if you hear anything about regression you know it's like yeah use a, 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 a lysosomal she's also it's also categorized as a leukodystrophy because of the white matter in the brain so it's sure. both in both categories yeah yeah, so it's, it's a great resource. We'll link to that in the show notes that for people that want to go straight to that page because it includes like 50 different conditions is what it says. Yes. Um, so that's certainly, um, I don't want to say all-encompassing, but, you know, that's a lot um, for it. That's to a good one. Yeah. Included. And I will, some of our kids are autistic. You know, their symptom is autism. So it doesn't have to be, you know, and, I, and it is listed, MSD is listed on some of the autism panels too. I think they're, you know, every oh, day they, they add those too. Yeah. Yeah, because I think a common misconception, like I'm a prenatal genetic counselor, so I meet with people, you know, preconception or during pregnancy, and a lot of people are like, well, can we screen for autism? And I'm like, that is such a loaded question, because right. if there's a genetic condition where autism is a symptom of that, yes. maybe there's certain conditions, um, but MSD, I mean, I don't think that's something that I'd be able to diagnose prenatally, because as you said, Willow's pregnancy was typical. Um, so right. there was no, there was no indications where there was any suspicions during the pregnancy. Um, so that makes it really difficult. Um, I think when it comes to diagnosis. Perk 
American Elmer Genomics is a global leader in genetic testing, focusing on rare diseases, inherited disorders, newborn screening, and hereditary cancer. Testing services support the full continuum of care from preconception and prenatal to neonatal, pediatric, and adult. Testing options include sequencing for targeted genes, multiple genes, the whole exome or genome, and copy number variations. Using a simple saliva or blood sample, Perkin-Elmer Genomics answers complex genetic questions that can proactively inform patient care and end the diagnostic odyssey for families. Learn more at perkinelmergenomics.com. Have you heard of TrackGene? TrackGene is a clinical genetic software solution used by over a thousand genetic experts around the world. You can customize the front page so it's streamlined to your specific workflow. The intuitive patient information entry page makes data entry efficient and user-friendly. Pedigrees are also easy to draw and document. Here's another vital feature. It supports HL7 integration to be used with other clinical genetic software, databases, and hospital information systems. So you can build custom reports with the simple drag and drop report builder. This has an interface with data visualization tools such as those from Microsoft to make it easy workflow. And there's more features on the way, all designed with you in mind as the genetics expert. TrackGene has an experienced team who's been working in the clinical genetic industry for, get this, over 15 years. You can request a demo for free. Go to trackgene.com. Again, that's T-R-A-K, gene, so track without the C, dot com. Stay tuned for upcoming episodes of DNA Today, where we're going to be chatting with TrackGene. When it comes to the quality of genetic testing, the most important aspect to consider is patient care. At Blueprint Genetics, patients come first. In order for a test to be considered high quality, it should provide valuable information for the patient. That's why Blueprint Genetics is focused on prioritizing quality and delivering answers to patients and their families. Stay tuned for our interview with Blueprint Genetics, where we will define what quality genetic testing means. In the meantime, you can learn more at blueprintgenetics.com. Again, that's blueprintgenetics.com. You know, you were sharing a little bit about, you know, Willow in terms of just her experience. What types of support and treatment does she and, you know, maybe other kids or other kids in your community receive to help them specifically with the, the challenges that they have because of MSD? Yeah, so she has a whole team of people that, that help her. Um, you know, two of the ones that kind of get overlooked sometimes are physical therapy and speech therapy. So if she doesn't talk, you know, why does she have speech therapy, but, you know, to help with the swallowing, the feeding, all that kind of stuff. Um, And they do lots of, you know, singing and that kind of thing, which helps her cognitively. Um, And then physical therapy, um, you know, she gets that a couple times a week from ones from a physical, both physical therapists, but she also gets what's called myofascial release to kind of, because she's starting to get, she's not contractured, but she'll get there very quickly if we don't work on her. And so the myofascial works on her. And I know, you know, I hear all the time about families say that their PT can't justify the treatment because they're regressing, right? PT is supposed to show improvement, but there are ways that you can, um, you know, they, that keeps her well and out of the hospital. And so you can document that. And we have a great PT who knows how to do that. So if anybody wants suggestions on that, I'm happy to share that information. Yeah, that's, that's a really good nugget of information there. I think that's really yeah. important. That's- And then she's got the full team. She's got a neurologist. She has GI. She has um, complex care. She has pulmonology, ortho, and I'm probably forgetting somebody, but she, it's a whole body. So she gets checked up on all the time. That's a lot of appointments to just keep track of. And, you know, it's like, you're, you're a busy mom and, you know, you, you've got all these appointments and everything on top of that. So that's certainly a lot, you know, and you're doing this, you know, obviously helping run the foundation and everything. So I'm just like, wow, you had time to do this interview. Um, but yeah, so Faith, I really want to pull you into this conversation because, so much of this and a lot of obstacles and challenges we've been talking about really stem back to when we're looking at nonprofits and you have so much experience in nonprofit fundraising. Can you share your insights on some of these challenges that are faced by rare disease organizations and, you know, also how you guys are starting to address these obstacles and able to do that because i'm sure a lot of people listening are also patient advocates maybe wanting to start their own nonprofits or have started and they're they're looking for that extra insight from you yeah yeah um no absolutely so 
<clears throat> I've been fundraising, and this is actually working with Amber and United MSD is my first experience with rare disease fundraising. Um, and, and, you know, fundraising comes with its own challenges. Um, rare disease fundraising comes with, you know, time, times a million. Um, you know, the, the first, the, the biggest challenge, well, I mean, even before we get to the biggest challenge for fundraising, obviously for Amber and her family and all of those living with MSD, um, the, the challenge is that our healthcare system in terms of development of treatments is set up not for rare diseases. It's really, you know, our, our systems are really in place based on large numbers of patients and then pharmaceutical companies can profit from developing a treatment and that doesn't apply at least very well for many rare diseases and certainly not for MSD. Um, so that has led us to where we are and Amber stepped in and, and basically was told take Willow home and love her until she dies and Amber said, that's not good enough for me. And um, basically, Amber's will alone has gotten um, this organization to the point that it is, which is amazing. Um, she convened th uh, researchers who were willing to do the work and, and identify a promising treatment. And now we are charged and working hard to fund it. Um, it becomes much more, you know, clearly the pool of donors of prospects who understand and are impacted by the condition is very small. And so it becomes a situation where we're, we really have to look at and, and uh, connect with and engage extended families and communities and really be able to make the case to folks who don't have any direct connection to the disease. And we do that uh, in a variety of ways, but, but one of the ways we do that is really making the connection between the research that's being done here and how it might um, inform treatment development for other diseases, other more common diseases. And, and that is true. And we do, we know that that is the case. It's a little tricky because we, we know that it's important and it will inform those treatments, but we can't say exactly how that will be or when it will be or anything like that. But, but certainly there are people who support United MSD Foundation who that is why they have family members who have Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or another disease and they have seen how close Amber has gotten uh, to a cure, and so they want to back us. Uh, another, we have a, a, a wonderful, wonderful supporter out of Boston, Massachusetts. She is a teacher. She's just a phenomenal um, supporter financially and otherwise. And her, she lost a niece to another, a rare form of cancer. And she has, she read about Amber in a, a Huff Post article a couple of years ago, and she just latched on immediately and, and has been phenomenal. And what she has said is, you know, she lost her niece and she just desperately wants somebody to win and she wants it to be us. Um, and so that's, that's what we do. That's what we're doing. We're currently, in addition to funding ongoing research to get us to a, a cure, um, we are, we recently launched a camp, a capital campaign called 30 Who Cure, which is, um, a, 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 we're calling it a capital campaign with several twists. Uh, so very getting very creative because of the rare space and these challenges that I've mentioned. And so the 30 Who Cure is actually, we are actually looking for literally 30 individuals or families or organizations that can commit $100,000 toward this cure. If we have $3 million in place, we can move forward to a research-initiated clinical trial, and that's what we're trying to do. We currently have nine commitments towards that 30 goal, and um, that's that's what we're trying to do. That's fantastic. And is there a specific website people can go to to learn more about that? We'll yes. include it in the show notes, but if it's easy to say. Yes. 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 So if, if the e easy to get to curemsd.org backslash 30 who cure numeral 330 who cure. Fantastic. Yeah, definitely. People should check that out. And I think it is so exciting to see, you know, for faith people like you that are so good at fundraising and figuring out how to even do that and how to ask people for money and, and how like the art behind that. And then to say, okay, now we have this. 
I mean, what type of, you're saying clinical trial that you're looking at doing, would that be like gene therapy? Like, is there a plan? Okay, mm-hmm. I got it right. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell I've been doing this a while? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's the, yeah, it's the, it's the ultimate. So we, yes, we, we work with Steve Gray out of UT Southwestern. I don't know if you know him, but he's one of the gene therapy experts, AAV9 virus vector. Um, and we treated a mouse, um, 2018 mice, multiple mice, cohorts of mice. Um, and, um, it was amazing. Like that the MSD mouse dies within, um, 10 days on average. It's a very severe form of the mouse, a knockout mouse. And they treated it on the first day and they were like, oh no, you know, is this going to be good enough to rescue? Um, because they were dying as they were born. And it did, and they lived a full mouse life. I mean, a like full so, full mouse yeah, life. Yeah. So they wow. just took them down, like you know, almost two years later, and then did the bio, you know, this uh, bio where they dissect them and everything, and um, right, like the anatomy. Yeah, yeah, and and looked at how much went to the brain and yeah. all that kind of stuff because that's our, you know, it's a whole body, but we need to get virus and the autopsy, gene to right? The brain. I think that's the word. Yes. 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 <laughs> They have like like a mouse anatomy. What do they call it? Yeah. Pathologist. Like, wow. yeah. Can yeah. you imagine if that's your job title? Like that is so specific and interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have to find I actually talked to, that. um, the Jackson labs is where it was done. And I of talked course. to I, I was, yeah. I was thinking it was yeah. Jack's. Yeah. Yeah. And I talked to the employees during COVID because, you know, they all continue to work. I mean, they're incredible, you know, and it's like, they're saving these lives. And so I, I showed them Willow and I explained to them what they were doing. I was like, what you're doing is so important. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. So the person that keeps that mouse alive, feeds that mouse, those are all critical employees. Oh, certainly. Yeah. And I've been, Jackson Lab has um, not a headquarters, but a location in Connecticut. And I've been there multiple uh-huh. times. I went to the grand opening because I'm such a nerd. Uh-huh. I was like, you yeah, know, my mom picked me up from college. They're like, we got to go to the grand opening. Um, I know. But, I want to go yeah. to Maine so bad and see. You I've know, been there too lab. because Have you? I'm a total nerd. Yep. Oh, my yeah. family vacations up there. So um, yeah. Yeah, we tied uh-huh. it in to yeah. Yeah, it's in Bar it's Harbor for people that want to go near right. Acadia National Park. Um, but yeah, that's so awesome that um, I figured mice had to be Jack's related. Um, yeah. but that is just so amazing. And I feel like you don't hear that too much of with a mouse model, such great results right away. Yes. Usually it's a little yes. bit more like, okay, all right, we got an extra day or hours, but like to go right. from zero to a normal lifespan or a day to a normal lifespan is that is wild. I haven't really heard of that. So that yeah. is so promising for a clinical trial and why the fundraising is so important so that it yeah. can happen. <laughs> TrackGene has designed a genetics electronic health record. Here's what it features. Pedigrees, demographic data, genetics information, risk tools, and sophisticated reporting, all within a clinician-designed workflow. It integrates with other clinical genetic software, databases, and hospital information systems to maintain accurate patient records. Go check it out at trakgene.com. Again, that's trackgene, without the C, dot com. And keep your eye out for our full episode interviews with TrackGene coming soon to DNA Today. How do you define a quality genetic test? As we know, genetic tests are not created equal. Different labs prioritize different aspects of testing. Blueprint Genetics has a patient-first mission. Giving a patient a result can help lead to better care. Blueprint Genetics has a team of people dedicated to sifting through this complex information so that results are thoroughly supported. With Blueprint, having human eyes on this data can help ensure it's valid. For patients that have been on the diagnostic odyssey for years, having a pathogenic variant identified that was previously missed by other labs can be life-changing. Stay tuned for a full episode interview with Blueprint Genetics, where we define quality. We also want to hear from you. Email us at info at dnapodcast.com to share what quality genetic testing means to you. You can also head over to our social media and share. If you can't wait for this new episode with Blueprint Genetics, definitely go back and listen to episode 184, where we discussed inherited retinal disorders. You can also learn more at blueprintgenetics.com. Again, that's blueprintgenetics.com. Did you know Perkin Elmer Genomics was one of the first laboratories to offer whole genome sequencing on a clinical basis? Whole genome sequencing can maximize clinical diagnostic yield for patients. With turnaround time of four weeks for the proband sample, Perkin Elmer's whole genome sequencing test is designed to provide access to additional valuable information 
compared to an exome. Perkin Elmer also offers prenatal whole genome sequencing as well as ultra rapid whole genome sequencing for critically ill newborns using dried blood spots. The ultra rapid genome has a turnaround time of five days and includes mito, chromosomal CNV analysis, STR, TNR screening, and biochemical analysis. Also, listen back to episode 176 with Dr. Maduri Hegda, where we explore the power of whole genome sequencing, which also happens to be one of my favorite episodes of DNA Today. And stay tuned for a couple more episodes with Perkin Elmer soon. Discover all that Perkin Elmer Genomics has to offer at perkinelmergenomics.com. One thing I wanted to mention before we wrap. Um, is that obviously you guys provide a lot of support for the MSD community. Um, for parents and, and caregivers that have a child that was recently diagnosed, I imagine, Amber, you can obviously speak to this more, but I imagine this to be a very difficult time. You probably felt somewhat lost in just figuring out, okay, where do we go from here? What are our resources? Who are our people? You guys are the people. Um, mm -hmm. So what's some advice on where they should start? Any advice? Um, obviously, go to your website, but yes. um, which is in the show notes. But um, any other words of wisdom as we kind of end the show here? I mean, we, we provide a clinical, our scientists have created clinical care guidelines. And, you know, we have all kinds of resources on our website, and we would love for them to reach out. We have um, a patient resource guide that we developed, and we mail that to them so that they have all of that right in front of them. And then we, we have a genetic counselor who works with us, uh, Brenna Bentley. And so she and I usually get on the phone with the family and we talk through you know, kind of what MSD is, what's happening, you know, and then we get into the science and, and the, you know, families always want to know about treatment potentials. Um, we have monthly calls with our families. I mean, we tell families when we introduce them into our Facebook group, we're like, you know, this is a terrible disease. This is terrible diagnosis, but our families are so supportive and we are here to help you. And, you know, and, and we all become very close. I mean, you know, many of the families are on our board, very involved with our foundation and, you know, good friends of mine, you know, that I never would have met otherwise. Um, so, you know, we're in this together. Yeah. The rare disease community is a mighty one. You know, you yes. guys just really pull together and support each other. And I think it's, you know, as an outsider, it's something that I just really admire all of you for doing that. And I just really want to personally thank both of you, Faith and Amber, for, putting all of this energy and effort and work into this, because obviously it means so much, you know, Amber, for your family in particular, but for all the other MSD families, ones that maybe you haven't connected with, but might because of this interview. Um, and a thank you for Brenna for introducing us too. Otherwise this interview wouldn't have happened. Um, yes. But yeah, no, you guys are just fantastic. I wish we had another 30 minutes to dive into things. Um, but luckily I think we hit all the high points. So I think we hit the important things to learn. Um, but definitely go to the website, dnatoday.com. Click on the link for this episode. You'll get lots of information because we mentioned so many links today. Um, so head over there so you can get everything. But thank you both so much for coming on and, and just sharing and Amber, especially for just being so open about your life and your family. You know, I know that that can be really hard to do. So I really admire you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And don't be afraid thank to get you. a therapist. I tell all our families that. Yes. Yes. Mental health is just as important as all the other medical It really things, is. So. My mom's a social yeah. worker, so I'm a little oh, okay. biased, but yeah, it's <laughs> yes. highly recommended. See, but they forget therapy. that. Like, you know, right? Just yeah. like you were talking about, you know, the family gets forgotten. Mental health is so huge. But thank it you is. so much. This is wonderful, yes. and we're happy to share. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you for helping us get the word out. For more information about today's episode, visit dnapodcast.com, where you can also stream all episodes of the show. We encourage your questions, comments, guest pitches, and ideas. Send them all into info at dnapodcast.com. Search DNA Today on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, so you can connect with us there. And a favor, please rate and review the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. This truly helps us climb the charts and allow more genetic nerds like yourself to find the show. DNA Today is hosted and produced by myself, Kier Deneen. Our social media lead is Corinne Merlino. Our video lead is Amanda Andrioli. Thanks for listening and join us next time to discover new advances in the world of genetics. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, they're all made of DNA. 
We're all made of the same chemical DNA. We're all made of DNA.